Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to session two that I will be moderating. Uh, I'm going to introduce the session and then I'm going to invite each speaker up uh, as I introduce what, their profile and also what they're going to speak about at this session. So the topic of our session is challenges to arbitration from international... We're going to examine this topic uh, looking or thinking about on the one hand all of the oft-cited shortcomings or perennial criticisms of international arbitration. It's too long, it's too expensive, it's over-regulated by soft law, arbitral tribunals are perhaps not always robust enough, they're a bit too worried about a challenge to their award and therefore they pay too much attention to due process concerns. So that on the one hand, coupled with, on the other hand, the advent of other options in the international dispute resolution space, namely in the form of international commercial courts. And in recent years, we've really seen a plethora of international commercial courts around the world. First of all, of course, we all know of the Dubai International Financial Center that was established in 2004. Then, of course, the Singapore International Commercial Court, 2015. And then in 2018, we had the establishment of the Chinese International Commercial Courts in Tianan and Shenzhen, the International Chamber of the Paris Commercial Court, the International Chamber for Commercial Disputes at Frankfurt, and then in 2019, the Netherlands Commercial Court, and also at the beginning of this year, we were waiting for the establishment of the Brussels International Commercial Court, but I think that that has been held up. That's not even an exhaustive list, but we see all of the new options that parties have. And the question is, does this pose a real threat to international arbitration? We don't have time during this session to talk about all of these commercial courts, but so we're going to focus more on the Chinese International Commercial Courts and the Singapore International Commercial Court. Uh, but we won't stop there. We're also going to take a look at uh, this tension in the context of international investment treaty arbitration. And we know that there has been, if we can't really call it really a shift yet, but at least a serious exploration which has manifested itself formally in the UNSI trial working group three sessions, uh, a state-led process, perhaps spearheaded by the EU, looking at whether or not a multilateral investment court that is a permanent standing court would cure all of the perceived ills of the current investment treaty arbitration system, i.e. the risk or inconsistent decision-making with respect to treaty terms that are very similar, the fact that there is no way to uh, oversee parallel proceedings, questions around the independence and impartiality of arbitrators, the diversity of arbitrators, and also costs and duration. So we're going to take a look at the investment treaty space as well. Okay, I'm very honored to be uh, moderating the panel, uh, this panel. We have some real expertise uh, on it. Uh, we are going to hear, first of all, from Dr. Fu Yong Chen, uh, and I'll ask him to make his way up. Uh, he is the Deputy Secretary General of the Beijing Arbitration Commission, the Beijing International Arbitration Center. He is also the Vice President of APRAG, and he brings extensive academic and uh, um, institutional expertise in respect of arbitration law in China, both domestic law, but also international law. So welcome, Dr. Chen. And during this session, he's going to speak to us about the Chinese International Commercial Court and its impact on international arbitration in China. Our second speaker is Professor Dr. Huala Adolf, and he is an experienced arbitrator, a fellow and a vice chair of the Barney Arbitration Center in Jakarta. He's also a professor of international law at the University of Pajajaran in Bandung, in Indonesia. And his expertise lies in international arbitration, international law, specializing in international trade and economic law and contracts law. Thank 
He's going to speak to us today about the key differences between international commercial courts and international arbitration. Our third speaker will be Mr. Peter Chow, who is a partner at King & Spaulding in Singapore. He's also the global head of the firm's Greater China International Dispute Resolution Practice, and he has extensive experience in complex disputes related to energy and natural resources, oil and gas, infrastructure, construction, and of course, general commercial matters. Uh, he's also an expert in arbitration in Hong Kong, uh, and he's admitted in Hong Kong, Singapore, and in various states in Australia. So welcome. And Peter's going to talk to us, he's going to talk to the question of whether international commercial courts are a real challenge to international arbitration or not. We'll see. Our final speaker is Dr. Tanis, Tanis Sucharikul. He is a director of the Master of Law program at the School of Law in Rangsit University. He is a, has a long and distinguished legal, academic, diplomatic, and governmental career. He was assigned to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to work with the Ministry of Commerce in the permanent mission of Thailand to the WTO. And indeed, Dr. Sucharikul has been practicing international trade law even before the creation of the WTO. <laughs> and he will be focusing today on international investment treaty and international investment, the International Investment Court. Okay, so without further ado, well, let me just give you a heads up with respect to the format. Each of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes and then we will have some time after each uh, presentation to open the floor so if you do have questions, uh, know that I will come to you and give you an opportunity to ask them. But without further ado, I hand over to Dr. Chen. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. I know it's a big challenge to speak uh, at a section immediately after lunch. So if you really feel sleepy, you could take a nap, but please do not snore. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, THAC and the organizing committee for inviting me to speak here. It's both my pleasure and great honor to be a member of this panel. The theme of my presentation today is the overview of CICC and its impact on international arbitration in China. I have divided my presentation into uh, four parts. Uh, first is the background introduction, and then is the, the second part is the establishment of CICC and its operation. Uh, the third part is the interaction between CICC and arbitration in China. The last part is some uh, conclusion. So actually, the establishment of uh, CICC actually is the bearing role initiative. So since the, uh, in 2013, the President Xi Jinping in China uh, uh, launched the Bear in Row Initiative. So many arbitration institutions or many uh, corporations actually, they are thinking about how to integrate the development strategy with the Bear in Row Initiative and to benefit uh, from this effort. So, and I quote the Justin from the uh, uh, Herbert Smith field. He said he, uh, he was uh, regularly asked about the trends in patterns in dispute resolution across Asia. He cannot guarantee that he can identify the next big thing for legal sector, but he is certain uh, that we are all going to feel the impact of China's one bear in uh, one row initiative uh, on our dispute resolution practice in this part of the world. So, ICC. Uh, they announced the establishment of Bearing Row Initiative Commission and also issued the guidelines on the mediation of Bearing Row disputes. For the HKIAC, they adopt a panel of industry experts to the Bearing Row Adv uh, Advisory Committees, uh, which bring together the legal and commercial uh, expertise across the infra, uh, uh, structure, uh, infrastructure, finance, construction in maritime sectors. Also, uh, HKIC also launched the online uh, BRI resources uh, centers, 
which intend to update the news in practical resources related to the uh, BRI project. For BAC, also, we actually launched the Bayer Enroll Arbitration Initiative uh, in, on May of two th uh, 2017, and jointly with the AIAC, the then uh, Kuala Lumpur Regional Center, and the uh, uh, Center uh, Cairo Regional Center of uh, International Arbit uh, uh, Center of Arbitration, and also CTEP. Uh, just last Dece uh, November, they jo issued a Beijing Joint Declaration on the Bay Road Arbitration Initiative, uh, and quite a lot of arbitration institutions uh, was joined in the declaration. So this is the big background uh, for the arbitration institutions. So, and under this big background, actually. CICC uh, was established in late, uh, 2018 and launched two branches by the Supreme People's Court uh, and formally launched two uh, branches. Uh, one is in Shenzhen, one is in Xi'an. It is envisaged that the Shenzhen Court will deal with the disputes arising out of the BRI Maritime Road and then the Xi'an Court will deal with the disputes uh, in related to the, uh, the overland belt. So the CICC will deal with the following kind of cases. Uh, the international, first is the international cases where the amount in dispute is over 300 uh, million uh, RMB. And also with both parties agree to submit a dispute to SPC. And also the second type of case is the first instance uh, cases have been trialed by the high court, higher court uh, and but re are referred to CICC by the court with the approval of uh, SPC. The third type is the uh, first instance international cases with high national significance. The fourth is the application for the preservation of orders uh, in aid of arbitration proceedings and the application of setting aside or enforcement of international commercial uh, arbitration award. Uh, the last type is any other international cases the SPC consider appropriate to be heard by CICC. So it's quite, could be quite broadly in, under these terms. And also how to define the inter, an international case, uh, which would be one or both parties are foreigners, and also one or both parties uh, uh, have their habitual residence outside of uh, PRC. The third is the object in disputes is outside of PRC. The last uh, criteria is the legal fact that create, change, or uh, terminate the commercial relationship have take place outside of PRC. So please keep, keep in mind, uh, be, be, uh, bear in mind, you know, uh, usually for the case related to Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, uh, uh, usually was treated uh, similar to the international cases in mainland China, but now uh, under this standard, it is not allowed to submit to the uh, CICC. Uh, and the judges, we have, now we have 15 judges actually, and they are all selected from uh, the, uh, the Supreme People's Court. They both have quite good uh, bilingual language and very good experience in handling the international uh, disputes. So this one key feature is really from, from other, uh, 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 other international commercial court for, because the Chinese law, uh, judges law still not allow the have judges without Chinese nationality. So we would like to have international judges, we have to amend the uh, judges law. And also the key features of the CICC procedure is that unlike, you know, each time they will have select uh, some of the judges to hear the cases, and unlike the, in other decisions, the CICC judgment may include dissenting opinion. And also, they have simplified, uh, simplified uh, evidential rules. That means if you, the parties submit evidential materials to CICC, they come into being outside of China. Uh, traditionally, they need to be notarized. And, but now they don't have to not notarize with the, uh, the, the agreement of both parties. And also, uh, usually they need to, if they, the, the, the materials is in English, a Chinese translation uh, is required. 
But in CICC, you don't have to uh, accompany with the uh, translation, uh, with the agreement of both parties. So all, like the, these three features actually is already applied in the arbitration practice in China. So we feel, in this sense, we feel the CICC is kind of the uh, arbitrationization of litigation. They borrow or learn from the arbitration uh, practice. And another feature of CICC is they appoint a 31 experts as they establish an international commercial expert committee and appoint uh, 31 experts uh, for the first batch. And they are all uh, renowned experts. Uh, and these experts can be entrusted to mediate international disputes based on the party's agreement. And also, they could provide advisory opinions to the courts, uh, to the, the specific cases. Uh, and most of the experts actually have come from uh, various jurisdictions, uh, and around 20 are from uh, outside of China. So you can find many big names in this uh, list. This is the picture of the, for the part of the expert uh, members. Uh, they have the, uh, the meeting with our uh, uh, chief justice. And by the end of last December, actually the uh, CICC has already accepted 13 international cases in concluded, uh, and you, as you can find, the parties in, involved from quite a lot of countries. And also they have concluded five international cases so far. In all the judgments and rulings uh, could be found from the website of CICC. So if you have interest, you could try to log on the website. So this is the operation of CICC. So whether CICC is a threat for Chinese arbitration institutions, uh, to be honest, we don't think so. Because the key feature, one of the key features of CICC is the one-stop international commercial arbitration mechanism. That means the CICC will uh, select uh, several, now current, uh, several international arbitration institutions and some international uh, commercial mediation centers to uh, build a, uh, a joint or one-stop uh, uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. So this is the application of uh, multi door courthouse uh, raised by the Harvard professor uh, Sander uh, in 1963. And also it is the the symbolize of uh, Chinese uh, strong tradition to seek the uh, harmony. So under this, you may be curious how this uh, one-stop mechanism will work. You know, now currently they have select five arbitration institutions in this uh, one-stop mechanism, including BAC and CTEC, and also, uh, and when we was listed in the one-stop mechanism, the benefit is the parties can apply pre, uh, prevention, uh, preservation orders before or during the arbitration proceedings from the CICC. It is part of the Supreme People's Court. They will, you, ordinarily, you could only res, uh, uh, seek the assistance from the mid intermediate court. Now you can go to CICC. They will help to uh, provide the, uh, the preven, uh, preservation orders. In second, you can also, if you don't satisfy with the award, you could go to the CICC to set aside uh, the award. And also, you could seek the assistance of the CICC to enforce the award. But the criteria, not every case is there. The criteria still uh, should be followed the, the, the standards that the I mentioned before. That means you should have the amount in dispute over uh, three 100 million RMB, uh, or other cases that have uh, national significance, or, or other cases that it seem appropriate to be, be heard or be assisted by CICC. Uh, so it has some discretions. So under this uh, mechanism, we believe actually CICC is a great support for Chinese arbitration institutions. So it's not a threat, at least currently, uh, to the arbitration institutions. Uh, and I think we try to explore a new way for the cooperation uh, between arbitration and litigation. 
So this concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions at the moment? I have uh, a question uh, with respect to the, current, the cases that have already come before the CICC. We know that there have been a few. Can you talk to us a little bit about how those cases came to the CICC? As you can find uh, from the, 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 the stipulation on all kinds of cases that can be heard by CICC. So for the last one, they say any case that seems appropriate by CICC. So for the current cases, to be honest, it's not by the jurisdiction agreement of both parties. It is, uh, it is transferred from the lower court uh, to the CICC, but with the agreement, we seek the agreement of both parties. So you know when the establishment of the CICC, they hope they have some cases to give the dispute uh, parties a new experience. So they seek the opinions for the appropriate, co uh, appropriate uh, case. And they agree, the both parties agree, so they come to the CICC court. Yeah. Yeah. And I understand that the CICC was uh, set up, it was largely motivated by the Belt and Road mm -hmm. dispute, and that was a lot of the narrative around its establishment, looking to the future for large, complex mm -hmm. um, Belt and Road disputes that would necessarily involve Chinese interests. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, will typically be multi multi party, multi jurisdictional, um, multinational. And so, what what do you see in terms of the frequency with which multiple parties from different jurisdictions will agree exclusively to the CICC for their Belt and Road disputes? What do you what do you think will be the future of the CICC uh, in respect to party agreement to the court, including from foreign parties, uh, given the setup of the court as it is at the moment? I th uh, we remain optimistic for the future. I, you know, so it's if you look at all of the some uh, features, some uh, feature of the CICC actually that shows they try to offer the very reliable dispute resolution service to uh, parties from uh, China and outside of China. So uh, I think, you know, when they include the, uh, the, the dispute resolution, uh, resolution clause, actually based on the bargaining power of both parties. And they may, I think, I believe some dispute parties would like to have a try. Yeah, and also from the first group of the cases, they conclude in very high efficient way, and also the, the judgment. Uh, also it has very high quality because it could find uh, from the website. And also I heard they actually, they, uh, before issuing the judgment, they seek some opinion from the expert, from the international arbitration expert. But they don't know what kind of the decision party is. They have made some treatment so that it is anonym, anonymous to them, but they actually provide some like, the, the opinions. So I think it's a, a, a for the, with the, some cases to start, there may, may be more to be followed. Yeah. And one would expect that the more and more that foreign parties are using the CICC and being exposed to, well, first of all, the eminence of the judges, which is beyond question, um, but that, that might um, lead more and more parties to using the CICC. Do you have anything to say with respect to the enforcement of the judgments of the CICC outside of mainland China? Yeah, you know, there's no New York Convention in this field. So currently, if you would like to enforce a judgment of CICC, China has uh, uh, concluded uh, 34 uh, uh, bilateral treaties uh, with the provision of judicial assistance. And most of them include the, provision, uh, the, the enforcement of uh, judgments. So from these uh, 34 countries who could enforce the judgment with uh, each other, and for other part of the uh, country, we, we only could apply the uh, reciprocal uh, agreement, reciprocal principle. Um, and also China now very active in, uh, in signing and ratifying the Hague uh, Convention on the recognition and enforcement of uh, foreign judgment in uh, commercial, civil and commercial matters. So in this way, it would be also uh, would be not a problem in the future. But compared with arbitration, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, in the, at least in the global level, uh, it's quite difficult to have over 160 countries uh, 
could uh, have uh, could re recognize and enforce the, the the award with each other. But this is the common challenge for all the uh, international commercial court, not only specific for China uh, CICC. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it, it's fair to say that this is a beginning. And when we think about the number of cases, for example, at your centre, I know that your case numbers are, are exponentially growing year on year. It's a, it's a real strong growth trend. And so for, I guess, all of the international commercial courts, you know, if, if we measure it that way, um, that's an interesting metric, at least to keep our, our eyes on. Okay, any questions Thank from you. the floor for Dr. Chen? Okay, great. Then uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor Adolf. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like, first of all, to thank Thai Arbitration Center and <clears throat> Professor Colin Ong for inviting me to speak at this uh, prominent APRA conference. <coughs> the establishment of ICC is meant to address the growing needs of settlement of commercial disputes in, national, in its national territory. Singapore founded its Singapore International Commercial Court on January 15, January 2015, and the Supreme Court's Pe Court, Supreme People's Court of China set up its China uh, International Commercial Court in June 20, in June 2018. The establishment of ICC was triggered because of the because of the uh, <clears throat> the absence of international courts, specifically dealing with international commercial disputes and the increasing critics to the international arbitration, especially the investor state investment disputes, which has arisen in the past 10 years, states seek to find a better alternative for the settlement of state to private or between private parties disputes mechanism, settlement mechanism. One of the alternative found is the establishment of ICC. With respect to SICC and CICC, Singapore and China have been the economic and financial hub in the region. Uh, the fast growth of, of commercial transaction has been the main reason Singapore set up its SICC to offer an alternative forum to settle international commercial disputes in Singapore. The desire to ease the resolution of dispute <coughs> uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative has been the main trust uh, of the Supreme Court of People of China to set up the ICC. ICC, however, however is not an international court set up by an interstate organization. It is a part of, uh, part of its uh, court system. ICC is a unit of the Singapore High Court and part of the Supreme Court of Singapore. And CICC is part of the Supreme People's Court of China. Although it bears the title International Court, it may be considered as a national court specific, specifically authorized to settle international commercial disputes, either rising in their territory or in other countries where the parties agree to settle the dispute to this international court. There are a number of differences between ICC and international arbitration. The differences may be classified into two categories, the legal nature of the two institutions and the effectiveness of these two institutions. The legal nature of the two institutions refer to several legal issues that become the norm <coughs> regulating the two institutions including its establishment, substantive law, procedural law, applicable law, the cost, the time, the issue of confidentiality, jurisdictions of the two institutions, and the judges. I will not discuss uh, all of these issues to the constraint of time. I would like only to talk the noteworthy differences between the two institutions. With regard to the uh, establishment, ICC established by the is, uh, ICC is established by the judicial organ of the state. is actually a state court authorized to settle the international commercial dispute in its jurisdiction, while the international arbitrations 
may be established by a private international organization such as, for instance, the International Chamber of Commerce. The procedural law applied by ICC in international arbitration is different, which would become an important issue. The ICC is a national or state court. The procedural law of this institution would be, sub would be subject to the procedural code applied in the jurisdiction. As a procedural law of the state, it must be strictly followed by the parties. The rules are not subject to the revision by the parties. However, the procedural rules of a state may be different with other states. This may create confusions to a party concerning the rules he is not aware of, to the foreign parties he is not uh, aware of. Although a number of the basic principles concerning the procedural, procedural rules are found in many legal systems. The principles of onus probandi <coughs> or the principle of audi alteram et partem are the basic principles recognized by most legal systems in the world. The applicable law. The issue of applicable law may be a source of difference between the ICC and the international arbitration. The applicable law of the dispute is determined by the parties. The choice of law by the parties is the law that the court must apply. In the case of ICC, however, it might happen that the choice of the applicable law of the parties may be subject to the rules of the conflict of laws of, this, of that state. Some states, however, determines that since the parties have referred their dispute to its court, the judges would determine that the law applicable to the dispute is the national law of the court. Under in international arbitration, the same principle applies. The law chosen by the parties is the, law, is the applicable law that the arbitration tribunal must apply. International arbitration, however, the choice of the law to the dispute chosen by the party is somewhat broad. The parties may agree to apply certain national law or even international law as envisaged in Article 42 of the Exit Convention. Next, the jurisdiction of the, uh, in, the two institutions. Another stark difference between the two institutions is the jurisdiction. Under the ICC, all the parties, companies, or even the state-owned companies are subject to the jurisdiction of the ICC. Jurisdiction of other states might arise difficulties. The state is usually, is usually reluctant to have its dispute settled by another state court. The issue of independence impartial, and impartiality may arise when dealing with other states as a party to the dispute. The issue of immunity of state as the ground for challenge to the jurisdiction of the ICC may also be used by a foreign state. The issue of recognition of the, of the decision of the ICC may face another challenge in other jurisdictions without bilateral regional or multilateral agreement on the recognition and, uh, and enforcement of foreign judgment in civil or commercial matters, such decision of, of the ICC may not be recognized, let alone enforced. The judges, another noteworthy difference between the two institutions is the judges. Under judges, under the ICC, usually the state judges, or under certain circumstances, they may be foreign national experts. Judges under the international arbitration is a private person or arbitrator. He or she is an internationally recognized person <coughs> of his or her skill and knowledge. They are chosen by the parties based on their expertise, impartiality, and independence. Next, I would like to uh, say something about the effectiveness of the two institutions. The most important difference between the two institutions is the effectiveness of the two institutions. The standard for determining the effectiveness of the two courts is whether the decision of the two institutions may be enforced in other countries. The decision of court to be enforced in other countries may depend upon the agreement between the states where the decision of ICC or the IE international arbitration are located. The agreement might be a bilateral, regional, or multilateral agreement. The ICC, however, does not have any multilateral agreement today in force, which enables its decision to be enforced in other countries. Arbitration has long enjoyed, has long enjoyed a mechanism where 160 countries 
in the world would give its commitment to recognize and enforce the arbitration awards made in the state territory which have ratified the New York Convention of 1958. The effectiveness of the ICC will probably be confined to the parties in the territory where the transactions and the dispute took place and where the ICC is located. The presence of the ICC should not be seen as the challenge for arbitration. The presence of the ICC should be viewed as a driving force for arbitration community, including APRAC, APRAC members, to re-examine and to find a better and a more amiable arbitration rules to ensure commercial community feel at ease and comfortable so that, they, they, so, so that it will increase their confidence in international arbitration. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Are there any questions from the floor at this stage? No? Okay, so I, I just have a very straightforward question, uh, Professor Huala, and that is that from the point of view of the parties, um, when you have the international enforcement advantage of arbitration, and in addition, you have the ability to participate in the constitution of the arbitral tribunal, the two traditional fundamental advantages of international arbitration. Why, what would make you go to an international commercial court instead? In, uh, in my uh, personal opinion, there are a lot of uh, consideration the parties may take into account the psychological issue, the, the culture, the economic uh, <clears throat> consideration, and also, uh, most importantly, the legal uh, considerations. When, I, when the parties invest their money in, in a certain region, then it would be easier for, for, for the parties to settle where their, their money is, is, is situated. So that is the, uh, uh, based on the consideration of the, of, the <coughs> of the legal perspective. Under the Indonesian law, for instance, the party may sue the, the, part, the other party where the location, the location of the asset is, 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 is located. So when the uh, the idea of establishing the SICC and, this, and the China International Commercial Court, because of these two countries, uh, <coughs> uh, have have its uh, uh, substantial, or they call themselves the economic hub. So everybody, a lot of people invest in these two countries, and and probably the dispute there. Um, uh, their business may fail or uh, the dispute appear, then it's, it's probably better to, set, to settle in this, uh, co comfortably settle in the, in, the, in, the, in the region where the, 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 the money is, the, I mean the asset is located. But, but <coughs> the problem is uh, when it uh, comes to recognition, as Dr. Chen already mentioned, that it will uh, create another problems when the enforcement, when the decision of the award is not uh, uh, followed uh, in good faith by, by the losing party. Okay, any questions from the floor? No, okay, then I think what we'll do is move on to our next speaker, Peter, who will talk about, uh, well, we'll really address the question of whether or not international commercial courts are a real challenge to international arbitration. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sarah. First of all, I'd like to um, congratulate the Thai Arbitration Centre and APRAC for organising this most uh, wonderful, excellent and successful conference. The topic I have here is really on the challenges to the arbitration regime and whether, in fact, there are real challenges. Um, let's look at the... Um, Dr. Chain has, uh, has discussed the reasons for these Chinese international commercial courts. In Singapore, um, Singapore is inspired to a certain extent by the English commercial court. We know that the English commercial court has been around for a very long time, very successful, 
In fact, most of the cases, a majority of the cases before the English Commercial Courts uh, involve parties outside of uh, the United Kingdom. And so with that as, as a model, and also the fact that um, with increase in cross-border investments uh, within, within Asia, Singapore sees itself uh, as being in a position to, uh, or to position itself as a regional hub as for the resolution of cross-border disputes. So let's look at some of the advantages or perceived advantages of uh, international commercial courts, such as those in, um, in Singapore called the SICC. We look at it as said, from several perspectives. Uh, the first one is the judges. In the SICC, the judges are from the Singapore High Court and also leading juries from around the world. So in other words, if you have a case before the SICC, uh, parties uh, can expect or would expect a very experienced uh, and distinguished bench. And I think that uh, for an, any international commercial court to succeed, it's important that the bench is a strong, uh, strong bench. In, in China, for example, Dr. Chen has explained that uh, the judges from the Supreme People's Court, uh, again, uh, I've not had any cases before the CICC, but from my personal interaction with uh, a couple of these uh, judges, I find them to be very uh, distinguished, sophisticated, very competent. So these, these will be attractive uh, features of uh, international courts. Now, you contrast that with an arbitration, and Sarah mentioned just now that in arbitration, well, you get to choose your arbitrators. So you, you can also choose good arbitrators. Well, that, that is probably right uh, according to the rules and in, in theory. But as a practical matter, when the arbitration involves a sole arbitrator or when you're choosing a presiding arbitrator, parties usually cannot agree on the sole arbitrator or the presiding arbitrator, which means that these will be appointed by the institution. And then it depends on the reputation and the quality of the institution involved. If a good institution, generally you get a reasonably good arbitrator, but uh, not necessarily of the same caliber, say, of an uh, international judge you may get in SICC. And uh, in, in those cases, for example, if you have a reasonably small case, um, if you go to an institution, it's quite likely that they'll appoint a less experienced arbitrator to adjudicate on a small case. But if you go before an SICC, even if it's a small case, you get really a very experienced bench. So that, that's one, one possible advantage. Um, however, this advantage may not be, um, be there if you have a very complex case. In a very complex case, for example, in, in arbitration, parties would choose uh, two very experienced uh, uh, co-arbitrators, and parties may may allow the two co-arbitrators to choose the presiding arbitrators. In that case, you get also a very experienced presiding arbitrator. So it depends on the circumstances. Now, in, the, in arbitration, the other concern about arbitration is that even though you get to choose the arbitrators, or even a, an experienced, reputable institution appoint an arbitrator, you may get a very prominent uh, arbitrator but my experience is that I've come across one or two so-called prominent arbitrators, but in fact, they don't perform as well in practice as an arbitrator. You know, some of them just, you know, they don't respond to emails, they're just uh, too busy, and some of them even got the law uh, incorrect. So there is still, it still may be an issue there. Now, con continuing this, uh, this uh, question of judges, in, uh, before the SICC, although Singapore is a common law jurisdiction, uh, it allows judges to be appointed from both common law and civil law uh, jurisdictions, which means that uh, at, the, at the first glance, this is a real game changer. Uh, if you come before Singapore courts, you get a real eminent jurist from a civil law uh, adjudicating on a case, deciding on a case involving civil law. And, and in theory, that is probably right. But in practice, uh, most of the judges in the SICC, they are from the common law countries, and about only two judges are from civil law countries. And uh, it, again, if you have a common lawyer from one country, say Singapore or Hong Kong, uh, they might be comfortable with uh, uh, the English law, for example. 
But the same cannot be said for a civil law from one country or adjudicating on a civil law of another country. A, a judge from uh, mainland China, for example, may not necessarily be familiar with the civil law of Thailand or Indonesia. So the, the comparison ca cannot be made there. Another important factor is uh, legal representation. Uh, in, in the English courts, uh, only barristers or solicitor advocates can appear before the English courts, and it, it, that's the same throughout most courts around the, around the world. Now, the SICC in Singapore uh, introduced the, uh, the concept that in certain cases, foreign lawyers can, in fact, appear uh, before the SICC. What cases? Not all cases. Only cases that uh, do not have a substantial connection with Singapore. Uh, for example, if the case is a negative, it's a negative test. So, if a case does not involve Singapore law, or if Singapore law is the only connecting factor, then it's considered as a case without substantial connection. So, the court will look at various factors, and uh, in those cases, uh, foreign representation is allowed. But if Singapore law is involved, then you may find that in, uh, in some cases, you still may need to engage Singapore law firms to argue before the SICC. You contrast that with uh, the international arbitration. In international arbitration, any lawyer can, uh, can appear and argue before the uh, arbitral tribunal. So you see that in some cases, the, the perceived advantages may not be as strong as uh, initially uh, seen. What about proof of foreign law? Uh, in most court cases, uh, foreign law is proved by way of an expert witness. And in an SICC, the judge can allow a direct submission of, uh, of the uh, foreign law without the adducing evidence or introduction of the uh, of, uh, expert witness. And that is a trend in uh, many international arbitration cases with direct submission. So that itself may seem, again, a, a game changer. Again, in practice, is that, uh, is that really the case? You find that in the, before the SICC, if there's an issue of foreign law, then you need to admit a, a special admission of a, a foreign law from that particular jurisdiction to argue the, common, the uh, foreign law. And this is unlike the international arbitration cases where any lawyer can argue on common law. And for example, I can argue a case on Chinese law or Philippines law, but obviously I would not be able to do it as well as someone from China or, or Philippines. But nevertheless, the, uh, the option is, is there. Next, the language of proceedings. In SICC, the default position is that English will be the language of uh, the proceedings. Uh, there's no provision for uh, an, uh, proceedings to be conducted in a foreign language or even as a, as a bilingual proceedings, unlike arbitration proceedings where you can be conducted in any language as agreed by the parties or with a bilingual uh, proceedings in arbitration. And even if an arbitration is conducted in, in English, I've come across cases where if there are voluminous documents in its original language, like Chinese, for example, you don't really need to... to uh, to translate all the documents. So that's an advantage of, uh, of the arbitration. Of course, another important factor is enforcement. Uh, we've touched about that. Uh, New York Convention, 160 countries, parties in New York Convention. There's, of course, the uh, uh, Convention of Choice of Course Agreement, 2005. The problem with that, again, is that up to today, uh, only the EU and one or, or three or four other countries are signatories to, the, uh, to, the, to this uh, Convention on Choice of Court Agreements. And uh, US and China, they're signatories, but they have not ratified the, uh, the convention yet. Then there's a new convention that came out last year, the, the Hague uh, Judgment Convention, that was relatively new, and that has not been in effect yet, and only one country, Uruguay, has signed to that. So again, um, that, that is still an, an issue there, you may say that uh, judgments can be enforced through uh, common law uh, uh, enforcement recognition or under the civil law by reciprocity. But nevertheless, uh, there's still a risk there. It's not as clear-cut as the New York, uh, New York Convention. So net-net, I'll say that uh, is it a challenge? Well, just look at the statistics. In the, uh, Dr. Chen has shared with us in China uh, about 
how many cases? Thir 13 cases. Uh, I heard from Dr. Chen a few days ago that uh, before the BIAC last year, they, ha they had uh, 6,000 cases. So you know, the, the difference is quite stark. I know that CTEC last year had a record of uh, 3,000 cases, and uh, many of them are, are international cases. Singapore, for example, uh, 45 cases so far since its inception, but out of the 45 cases, uh, almost all the cases were transferred from the High Court. And uh, for true international cases where parties actually agree to those cases in the, in the, in the agreement, I think as far as I know, there were at least one or perhaps three or four by, by now. Again, uh, parties have not actually signed up to the uh, international uh, courts. And I think one, one reason for that is because a corporate lawyer who's, who, who uh, drafts agreement, I don't think they will come spend the time to analyze which court or which foreign might be the best. They simply take the standard clause and standard position and go for arbitration. So, in conclusion, my view is that currently, at, at, at least as it stands, the ICC International Court is not a challenge to arbitration. However, however, we know that the courts in China and Singapore and elsewhere are continuing to develop and to improve. And they, it may well come a time that if the arbitration community uh, does not adapt to the changing needs of the stakeholders, the gap may very well uh, close up. And uh, the bottom line is, the, the real issue really is not whether a, a challenge is, is good or bad, but the real issue is whether uh, parties have sufficient options depending on, on cases. Some cases are probably more suitable for international courts, some are probably for, for arbitration. And, uh, but the, the real issue is whether parties can find access to justice rather than whether arbitration lawyers or arbitrators are losing market share to the, to the courts. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for walking us through all of those different aspects of the, the international court, um, specifically in Singapore as well. Uh, what I want to ask you is because, you know, you mentioned the challenge to arbitration and, and what the issue may be is if we don't respond to the criticisms to arbitration, um, then, then international commercial courts could become a real challenge. And I want to uh, ask you the question, do you think that the international commercial courts themselves are exempt from the same criticisms that are often directed towards international arbitration proceedings, i.e. it's too long, it's too expensive, it's convoluted, it's over-regulated, there may be some issues around independence and impartiality. What would you say to that? Oh, that that's a very excellent, uh, excellent question. I think bottom line is that it all depends. Uh, I've heard, I come across uh, criticisms that uh, arbitration is, is too long, too complex, convoluted. It all depends really on the, uh, uh, the tribunal and the, uh, the behavior of the, of the parties or the, or the council. And uh, there are cases that the, these uh, justifications are, are valid, but in, in some cases they're probably not. The, the bottom line really is that in international courts, uh, for the parties to have confidence in the court, then the court really must be efficient and must be effective. Let's take Singapore for, as an example. Uh, I, I first started practice in Singapore uh, nearly 30 years ago, and I recall that there was one particular case where I took over more than 25 years ago in Singapore. Um, by the time I took over the case, it had gone on for about 10 years. Construction case, six or seven parties, uh, rather complex. And uh, by the time the, the matter was ready to set down for hearing, setting down means that all the papers are in, they're ready to ask the judge for a date. And when we went to the court and asked for the date, the closest, the earliest available date was five years down the road. So it was 15 years process altogether, and six, seven parties all decided, let's move to arbitration. And that, that was at that time. And then at the same time, we did a mediation and the matter was set up within two months. And so that was good in that context. Fast forward to, to today, the Singapore court is uh, it's a very different court than the 25, 30 years ago. Uh, I've come across cases that can be resolved within one year, one and a half years. And you compare, compare that with arbitration, for example, um, as I understand from the HKIC, cases are resolved about one year or slightly more than one year. 
So you find that, that the courts and arbitrations are usually quite comparable in terms of, of timing. Uh, but again, I, I come across one particular case where the arbitration lasted 12 years, and then maybe an exceptional case. And I've come across cases in courts where it lasts for years. So it, it really depends on the, uh, the circumstances. And I think for institutions, we're, we're always called upon to issue our statistics in our average duration and costs. But of course, bundled up, up against, in, in all of those cases, you have, for example, a small contractual dispute uh, worth maybe 100,000 US dollars, along with a, a massive 1.5 billion US dollar joint venture dispute involving multiple parties that, so they're very different creatures and very different processes. So it's, it's a bit you know, we, we give this, this information to the extent it's helpful, but it has to be taken um, knowing how it's derived. Yeah. So I think that there are you know, a number of ways of thinking about international commercial courts and what they may offer over and above or in a better way to arbitration. And it may be with respect to, say, for the CICC, if you get a judgment against, for example, a Chinese party from the CICC, then you would you would assume that your enforcement process is going to be pretty straightforward. Um, so that might be a, an extra incentive for the parties. And also with respect to provisional measures, um, that might also be quite interesting, although what we see in Hong Kong with the arrangement for court-ordered interim measures uh, where you can seat your arbitration in Hong Kong and have an, a qualified institution run the arbitration and through that arrangement have access to interim relief from the mainland courts that has been very popular and we've had 13 applications under that arrangement to date and um, one of the applications was with respect to 1.5 billion RMB worth of assets. So I think that that those enhancements with respect to the arbitration process that are meaningful and make a difference to the parties in, in terms of protecting the outcome of the case, um, those are ways in which the arbitration uh, system can respond. Um, but I also think that with respect to international commercial courts, there's perhaps a, 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 a larger public interest that they serve and that they may be able to um, delineate a line of, of cases, put in place some predictability around certain issues that may come up uh, on a repeated occasion, including in international arbitration. So in that way, they can assist the arbitration system as well. Uh, and also just building a, a body of legal expertise and legal experts in various jurisdictions and bringing them together to work within the ambit of an international commercial court. I can see that larger public interest. Yeah. Do we have any questions from the floor? No? Okay. So let's turn now to our final speaker, Dr. Sucharukul, who's going to take us uh, on a tour of the evolution of international investment treaty law from the past, looking at how international courts played a role and where we may be coming around full circle again. Thank you. Okay, I try my best. But first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Thai Arbitration Center to invite me to uh, this panel. And I would like to also thank the audience and the great expert around me. Uh, now it's my turn to speak something uh, a bit uh, strange or has its own feature. Uh, it's not exactly national court, it's not exactly uh, international commercial court, but this is a hybrid, a hybrid. Uh, but before I'm going to the details, uh, I, I'm very sorry about, uh, I have also the paper, but my paper is not uh, in the PowerPoint format, but this is a paper. I try to summarize everything in just one paper. But uh, the screen is too small. If you can enlarge it to the second page, not this page. <laughs> this page is my, I have the second one, yeah. Can, can you enlarge it? <laughs> and, and then you, we can scroll, yeah. If not, you just listen to me first. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, the uh, topics that has been debated long time ago, since history. Uh, it can be traced back to, uh, even to the colonial era, the 18th century, whereby uh, the colonizing countries uh, would like to invent the so-called uh, international investment rules. Uh, 
to protect its own citizens and companies who invest in the colonized country. I think uh, the real basis from, uh, for, for international investment treaties may stem from the so-called diplomatic protection. Diplomatic protection is the old uh, customary international law uh, to some jurists. Uh, customary to international law is not written international law. It is a mere practice which has been repeated and with the sense of legal obligation. If you have three components, you can claim that this is a customary international law. Now, uh, what does it mean by diplomatic protection? They say that diplomatic protection is the right of every state. So long as you are state, you have this right. You can protect your own citizen everywhere. So long as your citizen enter into the foreign country legally. The whole state has to protect them, to accord them justice, due process of law. Okay? If anything was done to him, he was assaulted, his property was stolen, then the whole state has to do the justice to them. If not, it can be said that justice is denied to your own citizen. If your citizen has exhausted local remedy or local remedy, you file the suit in the court, you ask for the police to help, but nothing happened, then it can be said that the justice is denied. Then you can go to your home country, the country where you have nationality, and then your home country can take the case, raise the dispute from local dispute to international court or international plane, okay? I believe that the colonizing country used this customary international with some adaptation to be uh, the first uh, investment, international investment law, which we call uh, standard of international justice, minimum standard of international justice or MSIJ, which means that if your own citizen is invest abroad, the host country has to accord them justice, to accord them fair and equitable treatment, which is very problematic now. Fair and equitable treatment, non-discrimination, okay? And uh, you have to protect them all the time. And, and more importantly, uh, there shall be no expropriation except for public purpose. But even that, you have to pay just compensation. Uh, just compensation may mean uh, prompt, adequate, and effective compensation, which means that if you take my property today, either you pay me in whole today or tomorrow in order to be prompt. And secondly, uh, you have to pay me in an adequate manner, uh, which means the highest possible market value, you know, because market value may range, may vary it but the highest one has to be paid to me. And the third one, you have to pay me effectively, which means that you have to pay me in the hard currency, not Thai baht, but it must be US dollar, so at that I can invest somewhere else, okay? Uh, there, there are claims, the developed country, especially the United States, the rule of just compensation was invented by uh, Iri Hurut and, and Hal, Mr. Hal. Secretaries of State of the United States. Uh, but on the other end, the whole state say, no, you just claim for yourself. This is the customary international law. I don't, think, I don't believe that this is a customary international law. In my eyes, the only customary international law insofar as investment is concerned, international investment is concerned, is national law. Uh, we will at most accord you national treatment. Whatever we have done to our own system, you get at most, right? Uh, in terms of expropriation, if uh, a whole state, if Thailand would like to expropriate certain piece of land for uh, the construction of railways, high-speed railway from Kunming to Singapore, uh, and if we are going to pay my own citizen, not immediately, maybe by installment, and uh, maybe the construction price, and maybe in Thai Baht, 
you, you cannot uh, complain. You, you have to behave yourself like a Thai citizen. Uh, this is the so-called uh, the Kawo doctrine, the Kawo doctrine. And it has been debated very long, especially in terms of concessional agreement, which uh, is the topic of, to, uh, of my, 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 my speech today. Uh, concessional agreement is the agreement between the state and a private investor, which may be uh, normal people, normal person, or maybe a juristic person, okay? And the two sides claim different things. Uh, the investor and the home state say that it is a treaty. Then international law should be applied, okay? And the whole state say different thing, but this is uh, an, uh, a contract, a contract. And then it is subject to uh, national law and national court, not arbitrator, as you claim. Okay. Uh, the, the main reason is for this is that uh, a treaty. You have to understand what does it mean by a treaty. A treaty is an agreement between a state and a state, uh, or a state and in an international organization, or between an international organization and international organization. A contract, on the contrary is an agreement between an uh, ordinary person with another ordinary person and or an ordinary person with a juristic person or a juristic person with another juristic person. But a constitutional agreement is in between. One side is state, another side is individual. So they can claim as they wish, okay? And now come the ICSID, which is ISDS, they claim that, uh, let's forget about the debate. We should concentrate on the procedures, okay? And let's forget about uh, any problems arising from the two doctrines, MSIJ or CARVO. Uh, let's conclude bilateral agreements, which you can do uh, by your own. You can dovetail the details of the BIT according to your, uh, your wish, okay? So the BIT contain both some sub substantive laws and procedural law. Substantive laws may be uh, the investor shall be a court fan, equitable treatment, uh, non-discrimination, due process of law. Uh, there shall be no uh, expropriation except for big, big purpose and against just compensation. And it is interesting to me when I first joined the foreign ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, very long time ago, uh, I object to the joining the ICSID because why should we go, why should we join the IC, IC, I, ICSID because we rarely invest abroad. We are just the whole state. So, so Thailand, finally, we, uh, uh, we, we, we are the signatory to, to the ICSID, but we have not yet uh, just uh, ratified it, ratified it. So it may be a few countries which has not ratified the ICSID, okay? And uh, whenever we conclude bilateral agreements, we have never used the word just compensation. We try to deviate, we like to use uh, appropriate compensation. Uh, this topic has been debated even in the UN. Uh, several developing countries try to put forward the so-called NIEO, the movement towards new international economic order there are several uh, General Assembly resolutions. Uh, one of them is 1308, permanent sovereignty over natural resources, uh, which means uh, they try to compromise between the two claims. They say that uh, concessional agreement should be governed by the concessional agreement provision itself, by national law and by international law. Uh, so long as the court in concern is concerned, you have to use national court first. And if the two parties agree, uh, we can go to uh, international court, okay? But uh, I think around 1974, uh, the NIEO is to the extreme. Uh, we have the so-called Charter of Economic Rights and the United States. They say that concessional agreement must be subject to national law and national court only. And this is the rational wines, several countries uh, go to BIT, BIT, in order to avoid the, the debates between the two, the two sides, to make it clear the rights and obligations of the investor. 
And this topic is very interesting to me that I think that the state which propose or advocate for arbitration is mostly developed state. But now, uh, the state which trying to revert back to all the, to the national court, to the court uh, or to adjudication uh, came from the EU, including England, which is uh, the, uh, the colonizing state too, okay? Uh, now, uh, I, I can go to, to the point uh, why we have ICSID. Uh, the rationale for the ICSID is to the politicize. Let's forget about the debate. We just concentrate on the procedures. Uh, you can put bilateral agreements. You can put forward any substantive law. But should anything wrong happen, and you have to go to the dispute, you can refer to ICSID as the dispute settlement mechanism, okay? And now, okay, I can go to you. And now, uh, if you can uh, take a look at uh, the second, uh, Uh, the legitimacy uh, to decide a uh, concessional agreement. Uh, ICSID uh, say that uh, concessional agreement should be decided by a neutral third party to protect the investor who does huge investment. Okay, uh, this is the rational why uh, the ICSID is established. Uh, they try to protect the investor because the in the the investor has. Uh, less power than the state, especially when, when they are in the whole state. So in order to protect the investor, you have to have some law to protect them. And this is the rationale why you should use the ICSID. And uh, on the contrary, uh, the whole state usually say that concessional agreement should be decided by a judge of the whole state, since it involves uh, public natural resources and, and infrastructure, which involve uh, public welfare. Okay, uh, which is now uh, the rationale behind the movement for the International Investment Court by, uh, by the EU. By the EU. Uh, I think that the, the main reason why uh, the EU moved uh, to that effect may be because uh, ICSID, uh, since its distribution until now, uh, the arbitrator uh, tends to uh, make a decision uh, in favor of, of, uh, of, of the investor, of the investor, which is natural uh, because uh, the arbitrator must decide the case according to the agreement. The arbitrator should decide the case according to what the law is, or lex lava. So everything contained in the agreement, every provision in the concession agreement the agreements must be observed. And the arbitrators may not think about what the law should be. Uh, in international law, we call the if the law, If the agreement doesn't say anything about that issue, protection of the environment, some BIT has been concluded in a very long time before the world has suffered from uh, greenhouse effect from climate change. Uh, but when the arbitrator has to decide the case, they have to look to the provisions of the agreement. They will not look to what the law should be. Should we protect the environment in spite of the fact that the concessional agreement is silent on that matter? Okay. And I believe this is a big issue why uh, some major developed countries which see the merits of protecting the environment. We have to see some change in the ICSID because the ICSID is too much legalistic. They doesn't take a look upon the plight or the welfare of the people of the world. Okay, I think this is rational behind. Now, come to uh, the second part, uh, whether uh, the International Criminal Court 
will be success. I think uh, if you take a look uh, uh, at the second uh, at the second column, uh, I think uh, it stems from the decision of the EU uh, in the Slovakia and ACMIA in 6 March uh, 2018. Uh, it said that BIT between EU and Canada and, and Vietnam are, com are incompatible with the EU law. And they proposed to reform ICSID. Uh, in the third column, uh, this is the feature of the International Investment Court. Uh, they, the EU proposed to establish the ICC to replace the ICSID. The IIC will be a permanent court dealing with ISDS. And the ICC will apply permanent law, which will induce certainty and predictability. Uh, because arbitration, the parties to the dispute can choose the law, okay? Uh, but the IIC, uh, you cannot choose the law, and therefore certainty and predictability. You know, the parties to the dispute know before or beforehand that what law will be applicable to them should a dispute arise. And, and, and the ICC will have the appeal mechanism. The ICSID. They, they do not have uh, appeal mechanism, except in certain circumstances, which I don't delve into details. And the ICC rationale are to removal of parties' autonomy, promotion of transparency, warden of forum shopping, forum shopping, forum shopping, and uh, enforcing state rights to regulate legitimate public interests, such as protection of the environment. Uh, but what I see, the different uh, uh, the problems. Or which I call impediments. Uh, first of all, uh, according to the Vienna Convention or the Law of Treaty, Article 26, which we call Pact of the one Agreement must be observed, which including BIT. Okay? Uh, and it says that every treaty in force is binding upon the party and must be performed by them in good faith. So in terms of the ACMIA decision, you can enforce within EU, but you are legal relation, relationship between EU and, and Vietnam and Canada is different thing because it's international obligation. And if it is a treaty and, it is, and if there is an international obligation, Article 26 apply that you have to respect even though your law is not in agreement with uh, the treaty. And another thing is uh, Article 27 of the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaty uh, the relationship between internal law and observance of the treaty, it says very explicitly that a party may not invoke provisions of internal law as justification for its failure to reform a treaty. If that is the case, how can the EU and other states in the world do? Because so long as the BIT has not been uh, withdrawn or renounced, uh, they are still in force and they are biding upon the state. It but may Dr. happen. Dr. Suchiruko, can, if I can ask you a question, you've alluded to a number of very interesting uh, developments. First of all, the fact that a lot of states have become very defensive about the bilateral and multilateral treaties that they've signed, some of which have no carve-outs with respect to environmental regulations or health regulations, those areas of uh, public life that the state holds dear, and it's one of the most important aspects of its sovereign regulatory powers. So the defensive nature of the states and now looking to find a, or to change the system as opposed to changing the substantive protections within the treaties. So first of all, changing the system, looking at having an appeal mechanism, having a standing international investment court, um, and also revoking treaties um, terminating treaties, uh, and then perhaps in some spheres as well, um, renegotiating treaties to put in the carve-outs, to put in the substantive protections and to, to limit them to, to really get to the heart of what the complaint is, i.e. that states have found themselves on the wrong side of awards for very high amounts, um, which is very difficult to sell to one's citizenry. Um, do you think that a, uh, a multilateral standing court 
effectively deals with all of the systemic, as they're known, or as they're described, ills of investment treaty arbitration, do you think that that is the best solution, is the standing court? Uh, between uh, investment court, international investment court, and uh, international arbitration. Uh, which one is better, right? Uh, I think it depends whether or not you can uh, adopt a new international investment treaties. If the international community has a will that from now on we should resolve uh, the dispute uh, finally, then we should have international invest agree investment agreement I say international investment agreement or international investment treaty. And in that treaties, we can have uh, several provisions. One provision may be that should a dispute arise between an investor and a state, it shall be used, the IC mechanism, all right? And there may be another provision saying that all BITs which have reference to uh, ICSID, then the ICSID shall be interpreted to mean IC court, okay? If you can negotiate. But uh, the big problem is that I don't know if at the present time, state in the international communities has a will to do the IIC. Uh, it is a very big problem because uh, how can you do with uh, around 3,000 BITs, all right? And can uh, the one size fit all? The ICC can fit all the desires of state in the world. Uh, it's a big question. And another problem is the enforcement. The enforcement, as everybody knows, at the present time, if uh, it is arbitral awards, it can be enforced everywhere to the contracting parties, to the New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Arbitral Awards, which at the present time, I understand about 161. I just you know, checked it from the internet yesterday, 161. And uh, if you are going to have the ICC, and if the ICC, IIC do not have uh, a provision with respect to uh, recognition and enforcement, which it should have. I believe that if there is an ICC agreement or international investment treaty, they should have a provision with respect to the ICC court and the recognition and enforcement of the ICC court. Then any state which is a party to the new IIC will have to be abide by, by the provisions, okay? But if not, uh, as I have put it here, uh, you have to depend on the Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreement, CCCA, which at the present time, you have only six parties uh, and some Commonwealth state, which is less than 10. Commonwealth is more than 10. And some uh, Middle East, uh, leaks, uh, which has less than 10, okay? It is not comparable to the New York Convention on Enforcement uh, of uh, Arbitral Awards, which has 161. Uh, this is the weak point. But anyway, it can be done. The big question is that every state in the world is ready to, uh, to, to go for the IIC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the floor? Yes, Robert. If we could have a microphone at the front, please. Thanks. So um, just wanted to ask about the regional comprehensive economic um, RCEP that is due to be signed in uh, February, I believe. And uh, I think that the ASEAN countries, China and India, are all going to be parties to RCEP. So roughly half the world's population. So this is a very big deal. 
And my understanding, I haven't seen the text, but my understanding is that it provides for arbitration and not for any kind of commercial court. I just wondered if anyone else uh, knows more about that and is able to, to fill us in. Um, if not, then going with my limited information, that seems to me that it's still a vote in favor of arbitration, uh, and it's a, a vote in favor of arbitration by uh, non-colonial powers, because it's the ASEAN countries, China and India. But uh, if anyone on the panel could add anything, I'd be interested. Thanks. I don't have specific information, but just one thought that actually for the international commercial court, actually is created to handle commercial dispute in my understanding. Uh, it's not intent, basically it's not intent to, uh, to handle the investment, uh, uh, investor in state uh, dispute. So especially for Chinese, uh, CICC clearly uh, the provision that they don't handle ISDS, uh, uh, this kind of uh, disputes. But one thing is, you know, for BAC, actually, we issue an uh, international investment arbitration uh, rules and try to uh, provide the uh, Chinese approach to resolve the user's concerns on ISDS mechanism. So, it's, uh, for example, we have the appealing, uh, uh, an optional appealing uh, uh, mechanism. So, it's quite uh, interesting and may attract uh, the users in, uh, in the future. And if we, if we, now we are working that if we need the assistance from CICC uh, on the, uh, the investment state uh, disputes, so it might be very, become more strong for this, uh, uh, this kind of service. I, I'm no expert in this, uh, in this area, but I know that uh, some years ago when they introduced arbitration in the trade agreement in Korea, there was, a big, uh, there was a big protest going on in Korea, and everyone in the street uh, know about arbitration. And suddenly everyone in Korea is very knowledgeable about arbitration. I'm not suggesting that the same thing happened in, in ASEAN for this one, but uh, you know, it may create some interest in what real, really arbitration is, is all about. Any other questions? I think we have time for one more. Yes. Thank you, Jeffrey Lowe from CAA. Um, I want to make an analogy um, for the I, uh, International Investment Court to the WTO Dispute Resolution System. Um, they are very similar in their structure. For example, like under WTO Dispute Resolution System, they also have two layers. The first layer is ad hoc panel decision, and the second layer is the um, permanent uh, appellate body decision. And um, But look at the current status of the WTO Dispute Resolution System. I would say it's a little bit, um, I, I would doubt the viability of the multilateral international investment court system. Um, um, as we know now, under the um, US boycott, the um, appellate body is no longer in its function because it has only one member left, uh, which is below the minimum number of a, a chamber of, a, uh, I mean, um, to, to form a uh, um, legitimate decision. So would the um, International Investment Court, if it is um, established, face the same situation someday? And the second one is regarding the consideration to the public interest in the um, International uh, Investment Court system. Um, I mean, it's not necessary that because of it is a court, it will put more weight on the uh, public interest other than what it is mandated. For example, like WTO, um, dispute resolution system also suffers from the criticism that it considers only WTO, um, um, I mean, the obligation under the WTO agreement and no, not other like environmental considerations. So could the um, international investment core system really solve this problem? Um, that's my question to the panel. Thank you. Uh, I think it depends on the model. Uh, the IIC, International Investment Court, can use the model, the WTO model, uh, which is the first stage, which we, uh, we are panels. 
which is uh, I say my uh, uh, arbitration because you can choose the one who decide your destiny and you can uh, frame the term of reference of your own. Uh, I think this characteristic is similar to arbitration. But of course, uh, the DBT will have appellate body. The appellate body uh, shall comprise all eminent lawyers and they shall decide the case legalistically. legalistically. Uh, so I think it's the balance between autonomy and finality, finality, and and and, and legalistically, I think I, I don't know the words uh, to 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 show to 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 use in this uh, respect. Okay, uh, uh, autonomy and restrictiveness, I think, uh, or the law, the law approach. Uh, if uh, ICC IIC can use that approach provided that uh, they have to have some provision with respect to uh, geographical distribution of the appellate body. At the present time, there is no rules on that. It is unlike in the world court, ICJ. Uh, if you use the ICJ approach, then it will be democratic because you shall use what so-called, the so-called geographical distribution. Asia has 10 judges. Europe has seven judges, something like that. Uh, Africa has five judges, or something like that. In the DBHU, we have, do not have that rules. Uh, in practice, it's dominated by two countries. One is the United States, another one is EU, but I can accept that because United States is 50 uh, states combined, EU is about 30, all right? And uh, another state, Previously, is Japan, which lost a seat to South Korea, South Korea. And if we are going to establish the International Investment Court using the WTO model, first of all, let the dispute be resolved by something like panel, like arbitration. And it can be appealed because the EU, which proposed the ICC, they want appeal mechanism. The appeal mechanism is good or bad, it depends. If there is no appeal, the goodness is finality, shortness of time, right? But if you have appellate body or appeal mechanism, prudent because the first arbitrator, the application may not be so correct, so it can be reviewed by the appeal mechanism. So I, I think uh, WTO uh, model is good, provided that you have to have uh, the process of selection of, of the judge, which is democratic. If you can do that, it can be acceptable to the developing countries because they have representative over there. They have representative over there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, speaking of finality, and shortness of time, we have reached our, the end of our session, so please join me in thanking our very fine panellists. <laughs>